Hey there, Deadheads, I'm Pruitt. This is Jim Davis. And today we have an animated conversation where I raise a few questions on how to revivify the school of necromancy. So let's cast off on this web DM and get to it. Let's spare those dying to know what you think about necromancers. I think it's a good subject to raise, Pruitt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, necromancy is a oddball school I find in, yeah. in Dungeons and Dragons in that the stated definition of it has some some pretty like reliable standards sort of like life and death magic etc cetera, etc cetera. but there are a lot of oddball spells in the school mm -hmm. and there are some inconsistencies even within that definition of the player's handbook the manipulation of life and death magic including bol draining life and bolstering life uh, these would be spells like life transference innervation false life, uh, inflict wounds, finger of death. Mm -hmm. A lot of the more like arcane sort of uh, necromantic type spells that let them deal direct damage and, and harm others, blight could probably be classified under this uh, as well. As well as if you expand the definition of life, maybe like this is where contagion comes from, the introduction of diseases and things like that. Uh, necromantic spells also create undead, only a handful of spells, uh, Dance Macabre, Animate Dead, obviously Create Undead, are there for that function. And then Restoring the Dead to Life, Revivify, Resurrection, and those lines of spells. There's an unspoken facet to a lot of necromancy spells that isn't in this definition, and that's the manipulation of souls. Yes. Uh, whether it's Trap the Soul, Astral Projection, there's some in Xanathars that also sort of mm -hmm. manipulate the souls as well. Uh, magic Jar. Yeah, I was going to say right. Magic Jar. Uh, technically Clone. Clone is kind of one of those, yeah. Because you, your consciousness moves into a new body, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. So, so when it, your soul and your, mm -hmm. your spirit, soul, whatever, or true resurrection, bringing your soul back. Bringing your soul back. Of course, yeah, most of the resurrection spells involve some sort of manipulation of the soul or mm -hmm. things like that. So I, I can see where it fits in, and I think it's 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 should be there. Right. Yeah. I think that soul magic should be there mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in necromancy. It's the ex exclusion of certain spells that leaves me scratching my head, but we'll cover that <laughs> in, in due time. Yes. We'll lay hands on that in just a minute. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Here's a big one uh, that seems to always define necromancy, and I think yes. it's worth discussing. Yes. Is Necromancy, evil. Oh, oh, a thousand voices cried out. Cried out <laughs> in, in and simultaneously. A thousand flame wars were ignited. Yes, that day. <laughs> is it, but is it, is it evil? I think that necromancy itself is not evil. It is value neutral in yeah. that respect. I think in the setting of Dungeons and Dragons, people might see necromancy as as evil because it does manipulate the magic of life and death. And you're creating zombies sometimes. You're well, creating... You are creating zombies. And I think like the problem that I find in online discussions of whether necromancy is evil or not mm -hmm. is the conflation of necromancy with animating dead. P specifically, the fifth edition version, Animate Dead, which creates a skeleton or a zombie, and I'm sorry, folks, this is this this is in the fucking monster manual, right? It says right there the magic which animates a zombie is evil, yeah. and if left to its own devices, it will seek to snuff out life. Yeah, like that's the baseline mainstream rules as written D and D, which is mm -hmm. a world of black and white morality where you can fucking go to the outer plane. <laughs> and visit the plane. You can visit heaven. You can visit hell. You can see what awaits you in the afterlife. You have spells and abilities and, and monsters and everything that can detect, interact with alignment. Less so in fifth edition than in other editions of D and D. Um, and and this is that's the baseline of Dungeons and Dragons. It so is, what you're saying is it's evil. I'm saying that creating a zombie is an evil act because yeah. it creates an evil creature. Yeah. And even if, and this is, trust me, I've heard these arguments before, you're not probably not gonna say anything I haven't already heard, uh, is that even if the necromancer is on it, and they're like, oh, I, I'm only using this zombie for good, I have benevolent reasons for wishing to animate this corpse and fill it with life-hating negative energy, mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna be a good boy and make sure that it never escapes my control. Well, you know, you're not gonna guarantee that. And number two, it's only your magic that you have to renew every day, which keeps this ravenous life-hating necromantic uh, monstrosity in line. 
So in that respect, the creation of undead is an evil act because it brings into existence an evil creature. That's baseline Dungeons and Dragons. If you want to change that, I invite you to do whatever the hell you want that works for your game. Yeah. This is Dungeons and Dragons. You can change whatever about it that you want. And there have been plenty of times when zombies in my worlds have been neutral, animated corpses. They are not life-hating necromantic beasts. They're just... Necromancy is the marionette string that manipulates this meat puppet. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> and that that's it. And, yeah. and necromancy is not like this evil, vile thing. If you want to change that, just like if you want to change the alignment system, how that works, you want to change the way any aspect of the D&D world works or its lore, you can do that. Yeah. But I want, I want lawful good goblins. You can All have that. You can do that as well. And <laughs> you can have a lawful good necromancer. Uh, <laughs> you can even have that in baseline D&D. There just might not be animating that many corpses. Yeah. And so the reason I keep bringing it up is obviously there. this is a topic that gets a lot of people going. And there are people who are like, well, but necromancy isn't necessarily evil. And But the fact of the matter is, is that in the baseline it works one way. And if you want to change it, you are free to, you are welcome to, and you should. But to argue that the rule book says something differently is... Yeah, it doesn't. It's evil. It's an evil zombie, right? Everybody knows zombies are evil. Right. Right. R right. Right. <laughs> um, you you mentioned uh, the benevolent use. Sure. Uh -huh. Of this. Yeah. What, benevolent necromancer. The benevolent necromancer. How how would you how would you make a benevolent me necromancer? What would that look like? What what is it missing? What, uh, it, well, yeah, what does it take? It, it's the, necromancy is missing the healing spells. Well, it's right. Yeah, it's kind of right there. It's kind of right there. It has the inflict wounds. It's got inflict wounds. It's got harm. It's got life transference, which is one of the newer spells in Xanathar's. It's got innervation, which is right. like life transference, but only uh, it's life transfer is like the caster harms themselves, gives it to someone else. Innervation is more like I'm going to harm you and gain something right, uh, right. Back, like a life drain. Uh, right, type right. Spell. But it also has the resurrection, revivify, it's got resurrection, revivify, all that. Yeah, and the fact that gaping holes. It really is though, right? It needs like, to be healed. It needs to be healed. I move cure wounds. Uh, and healing word, uh, at the very least, yeah. into necromancy. I think healing spirit is more accurately conjuration because it's conjuring a spirit of healing, yeah. right, that exists uh, as a thing in which the caster has control over it. And to be perfectly frank, the other healing spells I've never really seen in play, uh, I would be, my, my default would be to, uh, to, to put all healing type magic into necromancy unless it's well, clear through the working of the spell it should belong into another uh, category. Like what's that, like Beacon of Hope? Beacon of Hope is one, Prayer of Healing, Prayer of healing. is another, um, Aura of some, there's a Paladin Aura, uh, one of the higher level fourth uh -huh. or fifth Paladin spells uh, that might do it, so. Oh, that's the one that's badass, like every, is that? Well, that's one is, if you combine it with a lore bard who dipped into life cleric, it can be. Yeah. <laughs> it can. Well, it's just like every bonus act or bonus, bonus action or whatever, you can do 2D. That uh, healing, healing spirit is kind of yeah. like that as well. So there's a lot of healing spells out there, and I would put them almost all in necromancy, unless by reading the spell, it seems like it belongs in another category, yeah. right? Like, and this is one of those things about the D&D uh, spell school system, where because it's a mix and mash, it's, a, it's sort of just this melange of 40 years of D&D lore and, and different designers having different takes on the way the spells work and new spells being introduced that then become part of the standard spell repertoire mm -hmm. and all of this stuff. And then I'm sure that there's a lot of it where they're wanting to like balance the spell schools against each other in some way. Although as we've been doing these spell school shows we've definitely seen that there's not a lot of balance between like the number of spells that are available per level or cantrips or anything like that right I, to be perfectly frank I don't know why the spells are divided up between the schools the way they are in 5th edition but mm -hmm. uh, in terms of benevolent necromancy if I wanted to feature it if I had a character who was like yeah I'm a benevolent necromancer uh, then I would include some kind of healing magic I bet you don't know the answer though I bet you I know why healing is an under necromancy. What's that? And that's because wizards traditionally are not allowed to heal. Right? Like, you know, in, in traditional D&D, there's a sharp line between divine and arcane magic. And yeah. arcane magic tends to be more destructive in power and capable of these big overt effects. And divine magic is, tends to be more supportive and, and uh, less flashy. Yeah. Although, obviously, there are exceptions to that <laughs> in, in many ways. I would just say, let's go ahead and um, completely tear down the divide and just say, you know, necro necromancers are able, capable of healing. That's why you would become a necromancer if you want access to those kind of spells. But then that sort of like 
does damage to the class system and the strong archetypes that the classes are supposed to uphold. So it depends what kind of D&D you want uh, to have. Mm -hmm. um, the inclusion of necromancy, or healing spells in necromancy would, would change the equation. Um, it doesn't have to be available to wizards, of course. Well, well yeah, but... Right. Uh, just moving them to the school doesn't make them available. Sounds like anarchy, Jim. I, listen, if we wanted to just let every caster know every potential spell, then I bet that we would probably live. You know, I mm -hmm. bet you we'd wake up the next day and the world would still be here and, you know, we'd still have to go to our bullshit jobs and do a bunch of other stuff if we just let every caster have every spell that was available. We'd, we'd find that the world continued on <laughs> and that it's not as bad as we're afraid of. So, so but, but, the, but the necromancer can get up to some crazy shit, though. Yes, they can. The necromancer uh, can get up to some crazy shit. If we're putting shit, aside, yeah. like, oh, who cares if it's evil or not. Like, with, with the spells that they have at their disposal. It, it offers a wide array of effects, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of, like, direct damage type spells. There's a lot of debuffs. There's a lot of things. A, a necromancer proper, of course, has boosted... Uh, zombies and skeletons that they that they do want to use. A necromancer is, I think, probably one of the stronger spell schools out there for wizards to specialize in, um, in that it does offer a wide variety of effects, and of course the class abilities of a necromancer uh, only bolster those. The other kind of casters out there who would use necromancy, you know, you can gain a benefit from having an undead follower uh, or something like that, even if you're not going like the necromancer route with like the boosted uh, stats. It's always nice to just have a zombie around to open doors, set off traps, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> scout ahead. Stand uh, in, in front some of ways. you with a shield. Stand in front of you with a shield. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uses for just a body. Hold a torch. Um, you know, hold a rope. But in terms of just like raw necromantic power, like creating your your you know horde of undead. It's difficult to do in Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to uh, to get that kind of army of darkness feel where there's you know just a, a legion of, of marching skeletons or or a horde of, of, of shambling walking dead uh, that you might see by the calculations I've done and then sort of like looking up online at the people who are obsessive about this kind of thing. A full like twentieth level necromancer has something along the lines of 146-ish zombies. Some of those are gonna come from the mummy lord that they have commanded with their command undead feature, and they're gonna create undead to create like ghouls and whites. Of course, whites are gonna create more zombies that they then can control. So you top out somewhere, I think, uh, north of 200 control minions that you control, or you either control a minion who controls their own minions, mm -hmm. but that's still far short of the army that right. that we're looking for here so we have to go outside these standard rules to to get that legion of, of undead that we want <laughs> right right to counterbalance that like we did before is there a way to use that necromancy that necromancy for good does it have to always be evil like you know i'm not for attacking or, or whatever but like eberron yeah mm -hmm. You're talking, about, you're talking about more like uses of necromancy in society yeah. that are not necessarily... Okay, I, I like Deberon. There's the, the nation like Karnath, uh, or mm -hmm. maybe misremembering, mispronouncing it right now. And then, of course, there are the elves uh, that, that live on uh, their island there. So, like, Neberon has these great, these two great cultures there that, that feature necromancy quite heavily and that have uses for necromancy that are... For me, they were some of the first times I saw necromancy used in a setting in a way that wasn't like, oh, this is the evil nation over here, and of course they've got armies of undead just waiting around uh, for that kind of thing. You know, they have undead armies, they've got undead labor force. It's sort of seen as an honor that when you die, your your corpse is used by the, 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 the country to, mm -hmm. to sort of, like, continue on. You can continue to serve your people, your country, your nation, that kind of thing. The elves have this sort of uh, using necromancy to sort of preserve their uh, their leaders and the kings and the priests and their queens and, and all those kind of like long-lived uh, you know, long-lived leaders who have a great store of knowledge and everything, necromancy is used to keep them around. And so, like, going off of these two sorts of ideas and, and sort of extrapolating them for other settings and, and figuring out what you might want to do with them in your own world, I think, like, an undead labor force is interesting, right? I start to think that through and I go, well, they're probably skeletons because I'm not sure that I want a bunch of rotting corpses tending <laughs> tending fields uh, and do, doing whatever it is that they're doing. So they're probably uh, skeletons of some kind. If you've got a labor force that doesn't need to rest, doesn't need to eat, 
doesn't need to be necessarily uh, attended to. You create the thing and then you go, give it a task and then it does it. Two questions come to mind. What about all the people who used to do that? Right, like this is the argument in, in our own world of like autom uh, you know automation of a lot of tasks oh, yes. and what happens right. to those jobs, that kind of thing. It's a question worth answering yourself. Then it's a question of who controls those undead and how do they control them? Do the undead in this situation work exactly like mm -hmm. the undead created through uh, Animate Dead and Create Undead and the like? In which case, chances are, I would imagine, in that society they've overcome that limitation because that doesn't sound particularly viable. You know, well, <laughs> anything can and will go wrong, and much like Jurassic Park, eventually <laughs> the workforce starts trying to eat. Right, society. <laughs> probably try to start eating them. So this maybe works. It works in Eberron because Eberron doesn't have absolute alignments, and, right. and Eberron doesn't have that kind of black and white structure to their world. So they can say that undead are just things. They're they're you know meat puppets or bone you know bone sacks or whatever. Yeah, if they're not being controlled, they just kind of sit there. They just kind of sit there or whatever. Yeah. You're using animate dead as your base, and you're saying, okay, it's a bunch of necromancers that are walking around animating these dead, and then sending them to work in fields and orchards mm -hmm. and 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 you know slaughterhouses for animals and things like that. Then it's like, that's something they gotta do every day. And they gotta do it sort of like before the 24 hours is up. Uh, because if they don't, then now those things are zombies free roaming and and uh, and and, un, and you know not out of <laughs> not in the caster's control. This is where you just come in and you 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 use the spells as inspiration. You come up with other things. If you just need it to work to work for your campaign world, then it just works for your campaign world. There are hordes of undead that go around performing labor, building things. We can extend this onto soldiers, right? Soldiering in some cases is just another form of labor. Now you have an army that doesn't need to sleep, doesn't need to eat, doesn't suffer from poor morale. Doesn't matter if it rains, snows, is it's muddy, doesn't matter. They're, doesn't gain levels of exhaustion. Doesn't gain levels of exhaustion, isn't gonna die to disease and infection and dysentery and, and all kinds of things. They're not gonna desert and wander off because you didn't pay them on time. They don't need to be paid at all don't like need supply lines. <laughs> they don't need supply lines they can march they can fight during the night it's one of those where I, I first discovered the, this sort of like the, the advantages of an undead army I was reading uh, military history and, and starting my my uh, uh, my, my graduate program in, in military history and was like, it was, I read it and it was one of those things where I went back and poured over every Eberron book I could find trying to figure out why Karnath didn't win the last war. And it was just kind of like, they're the only ones that used Undead. Like, they have all the other advantages that everyone else has. They have magic users and magic uh -huh. and everything else and, and whatnot. And then it's like, Undead are surely cheaper than Warforged, right? Which have a personality and, and a free will uh, and all that business. So I, I built a whole campaign around it, quite mm -hmm. frankly, of like this un stoppable undead army that was on its way towards the party and them sort of racing in time to try to like stop the advanced agents of this undead army that was on its way that was trying to weaken the society before the undead arrived. Gosh, I would love to have a legion of skeletons. That sounds like a really badass army. None of the problems that a traditional army has, and depending on how they're controlled, they might move like a machine on the battlefield, right? They, they, there's no delay between a signal and an execution of an order. There's no mm -hmm. confusion over what the, the order was. The necromancer just goes, well, I want this cohort to do this, and it happens. It's kind of one of those things where I actually, <laughs> I actually talked myself into thinking it was invincible, uh, with, you know, barring an intervention like a dragon uh, or something like that. I suspect that we'll see some pretty cool shit in uh, Game of Thrones over the last final season relating to its own undead army. But that's kind of what, it, what I think it would be like, the, the fall of, what was it, Hardhome? Yeah, oh yeah, fall of Hardhome was, was just, yeah, the, the, the dumping over the cliff was great. Right. <laughs> uh, just, now that does kind of ignore falling damage, like in a D&D. If it's not a crit, it doesn't kill them and, and they, get, crit, right they just get right back up. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and thinking of undead as labor, undead as soldiers, there's a lot of other things like world building when it comes to having an undead that are part of your society. If you're preserving the leaders as intelligent undead, whether that's mummies uh, or you're enliching someone or mm -hmm. you're, you're finding the, the ways to create like benevolent death knights or something like that, how does this impact the society if the leaders never leave? What if it's like uh, you have a mortal ruler, but the Senate is made up of the undead. 
And so the advisory by parliament, a parliament of corpses, right? The mm -hmm. parliament advises the monarch or whoever. And, and so you have this living monarch who is trying to test their, their capacity to rule, to make their mark on the world, to be a, a, an effective monarch or whatever. And then they've got everyone who's ever done that job ever available to them. Yeah as advisors, as counselors, and the goal being for that monarch to be, to be considered so well liked and so effective that they are able to join that body when it is their time uh, to die. Whether they're like the, the, the elves on Eberron, and I really don't remember any of their names. It's just like this elf's life is so long. They've lived so long, experienced so much. Letting them die is a crime. Yeah, all that right, like knowledge. All that knowledge and experience and everything. We can't allow that to happen. You can go the completely opposite route. This human lives such a short life. Like, they have no time to experience anything at all. We must gift them with undeath so that they can continue their growth and their whatever and, and, and be, reach their full potential as a being, even though they have to do it as an undead. Those are the kinds of things I'll think about when it comes to integrating necromancy into my world, integrating it into a society and making it the feature of a society. Other questions to consider are just like, uh, who controls all these undead? Mm -hmm. Why do they not run things around here? You know, what is it about the particular magic that this place might have? Is it, is it somehow vulnerable to something? Is the power that lets them animate all these dead, does it come with a cost mm -hmm. uh, or something like that? Those can, are things I'm probably thinking about. Can it be hacked? Can it be dispelled? Uh, let's let's talk about a, f a few of the spells because like, like we've discussed, you know, in other schools. Yeah. A lot of these, it's like, why is that in here? There are some oddballs. Let's run through those. Um, Started off, uh, blindness, deafness. I, I think a lot of these oddballs, and blindness, deafness is a good example, is a lot of the oddball spells in necromancy, I think, and this is my guess, comes from the fact that necromancy, in a, in a historical sense, is black magic. Yeah. It's the magic of evil. It's the magic of curses and of witches and hags and, and warlocks and people that, that mm -hmm. commune with Satan on the 13th night of the whatever it is, you know, whatever they're talking about. I think that that is, and it's a legacy uh, of, uh, of, of necromancy being seen as evil magic. And as I think we've argued, it doesn't have to be. Necromancy does not have to be evil. It, it, it can just be like, like the definition says, manipulation of life and death energies. But historically, the, the kind of black magic that's like we're going to curse others and attempt to control them and manipulate their mind. We're going to induce these negative emotions in them so that they behave irrationally and we can get what we want. We're going to commune with the spirits of the damned and conduct seances to, to sort of, you know, contact the dead. That That's where a lot of these oddballs come from. Mm -hmm. Like blindness, deafness is either a very specific curse, in which case let's just fold it into bestow curse and be done with it. Or it's like manipulating the, the body in such a way to induce these things, induce blindness and deafness, in which case why is it not? Transmutation. Why is it not transmutation? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> Unless we're arguing that all body modification magic belongs under necromancy under the guise of its manipulating life, Mm -hmm. In which case, all right, well, let's bring in Alter Self, let's bring in the other ones that, well, that manipulate uh, a person's physical form. Right, but I mean, if it's manipulating life energy, though, if someone is blind, they have the same amount of hit points that they did when they could see. Right, yeah. So what life energy did you manipulate? That, that's why, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, like bestow curse and eye bite are in the same vein here. Yeah. Because bestow curse and eye bite are these sort of like, I'm going to attack you with magic. I'm going to debilitate you. I'm going to, I'm going to inflict a condition on you that, mm -hmm. that conjures up images of witches and cauldrons and, and, yeah. and curses and the like. And so I see these three uh, in particular as being remnants of this idea of necromancy as black magic instead of necromancy as life and death magic yeah. and and I do think that blindness deafness bestow curse eye bite cause fear should be in different schools cause fear is an enchantment effect it induces fear in the mind of the subject yeah. how is that not enchantment 
right? Like, that's the whole thing of enchantment magic. Yeah. Uh, in the same way why fear, the illusion spell, we think is should, should be... Should be maybe an enchantment. Right, but not even there's not even consistency there because fear, the third level spell is an illusion spell, cause fear is a necromancy spell. And it's just, it's all over the place, right? Uh, Eye Bite's a similar way where it's like, it does like six different things. And it's like, how is this necromantic at all? Yeah. Like, how is this not a, a weird transmutation effect? Speak with Dead's one. Speak with dead, like, I, I mean, I see that because you are giving a semblance of life to a corpse. So this, this, is, this is a good case, right? Like, yeah. you're saying semblance of life to a corpse that, that falls under the rubric of, of, of necromancy. Yeah. If it's more like a seance ability, I think that belongs firmly in divination. Well, then there's that. I mean, you right. are seeking out information, you know, just because they are dead, they are beyond. But it's yeah. like, I mean, you know, contact other plane contact or commune plane. Right, or anything right, right. like that. It's yeah. kind of the same thing. You just are sitting here looking at the corpse of the thing you're talking to. Right. Now, the Speak With Dead I want is like the Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell in the variety. You know, they're in the peninsula. They're fighting uh, the Spain. They're fighting Spain. Uh, and and um, who is it? Uh, Strange brings back the Spanish soldiers to kind of gain some information about the army. And he basically like, animates them. Don't send us back. Like, we, like, and he's like, the, the corpses are just begging them. Like, do not send us back. Like, yeah. it's, it, we, you know, we came from hell. Yeah. This is, it's bad there. Do not send us. And I liked that, number one, because the lore of Earth is quite rich in what happens towards the people that get, that die. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's sort of like building on the lore of that Earth setting to, uh, to kind of like enrich the experience uh, for those casters. It's more than just, uh, uh, you know, my, this, this head starts talking to me. Mm -hmm. It's a partial reanimation for information purposes only, which I kind of see as a dick move. Right. Well, I <laughs> mean, know. hell, look at look at fucking Hellboy when he Hellboy's does that. Another one, when right? he does that they... to the to the spine of Dimitri, whatever. Those are the images that I think of whenever I think of Speak with Dead, of like a partial reanimation, a partial partially re, uh, uh, resurrection. The wording of the spell is all weird. It's not the person; it's the animating spirit of the person, not their soul. Which I assume is there to prevent shenanigans with, like, not letting them be resurrected or something. Oh, that's... Yeah. This seems like a whole big convoluted mess to just be like, listen, can you just let it, let us conduct a seance? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, Speak With Dead should be that kind of thing as opposed to the what we have. So it seems to me like an oddball yeah. in that way. What about Astral Projection? Uh, astral Projection falls under the soul magic. Yeah. I think you're projecting your soul across planes... In that sense, I don't like that it's in necromancy because yeah. it's kind of like... Mm. Well, I mean, it, to me, it's just an edge case where, you, you know... Uh -huh. But the fact that all other kind of soul magic is already in necromancy, it, it, it's one of those things where I'm like, it seems a little odd. Mm. It doesn't. I wouldn't immediately peg it as necromantic. I would peg it more as like conjuration. It, it, it involves like traversing the plane, moving things across planar boundaries. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, traveling to other realms. Uh, that's what astral projection feels like. But magic jar is in there. Uh, there's the, the the soul stuff that gets you know where you're manipulating them through resurrection and true resurrection. There's mm -hmm. trap the soul. So it's not the like soul, soul magic. Cage. Soul cage is another. It's not like there's not a lot of soul magic it's yeah. just astral projection seems like one of those that's at first glance maybe an, an odd one out mm -hmm. yeah any any final thoughts before the end i don't know i i think necromancy is one of those that people get really excited about and and, and defend and, and the like and you the, a lot of the arguments around it particularly whether it's evil or not and and the kinds of things that you do with it because it's dark and enticing and and sort of it's got this air of the forbidden right necromancers are, are those who t traditionally evil mm -hmm. there may be uh, you know in enemies or, or, or antagonists there's a lot of the great classes that that sort of uh, that sort of deal with necromancy are in the dungeon master's guide oathbreaker paladin and death Clare. So they are also uh, necromantic classes, but they're separated from the rest of the uh, the player's handbook options. So it gives it this air of being off limits, of being dangerous and taboo and the like. And so I think it attracts a, a lot of attention that way because people see it as, I don't know, dark and edgy maybe. Yeah. I like it just because I, I remember the, the old third edition um, 
you know, ray wizards who could like, you know, pump out a ray of innervation and give someone 13 or 14 negative levels or however much it was, you know, oh, God. maximized split chain rays of innervation. Jesus, uh, God. <laughs> those sorts of things. All those negative levels. Right. Um, I, I think more than other schools of magic, like to say evocation, for instance, what is the impact of evocation on society? Probably minimal. Sending is a pretty big spell that could Im potentially impact society, but I, I don't see a lot of... The telephone of... was pretty big. Sure, right. But necromancy is one of those where you can see society being impacted by the presence of this magic, mm -hmm. whether it's like state necromancers coming door to door to collect corpses that are then used by, uh, by the country or something like that, or a place where it's like, yeah, the necromancers took hold and they control all the food because they out all the undead and everybody else is kind of just out of luck yeah uh so it in that sense i think finding a place for it in your world is going to be um a more enriching experience than just like not thinking about it but that's sort of like what we think about everything so mm -hmm. you know big surprise most definitely cue the cranberries <laughs> Their spells and their wands With their and their spells. wands. Zombie, zombie. They are raising. No. <laughs> With their okay. bites and their claws. Um. Hmm.